Now, regarding mechanicals, here's the, the floor tubing layout for the basement. Start over here on the right. It's a pretty simple layout. You'll see individual circuits. This is all half inch tubing. And we laid this out starting from a manifold that is in the corner of the mechanical room, this area down here on the north central area of the basement is our mechanical room. So the manifold is located here and you can see our circuits go out. You might be wondering what's the deal with these out here? Well, a little hard to see it, but uh, my, my son-in-law and daughter said, well, eventually we might wanna partition off this basement. Right now, this is a big open space, which is really nice. But if they do want to partition that off, we set up the tubing circuit so where the partitions would go, if there was any mechanical fasteners going into the floor, we're, we're not going to be over an area that has tubing in it. And um, we could potentially adjust the flow rate in those circuits or put manifold valve actuators on those circuits if we wanted to have room by room control. Uh, we do have one other area here, kind of a, we'll call it the cold storage area. This doesn't have any tubing in it. Um, there's a breezeway that's 12 feet wide that connects the uh, house to the garage. And you'll see we tighten up our tube spacing. Here we have six inch on center tubing. Uh, the reason we did that, there's a, a fairly high ratio of exposed wall to floor area here. And this is also an area where, where people come in in the wintertime or if it's raining out, the floor is going to get wet. There inevitably is going to be snow and water on that floor. So we wanted to have a little higher heat flux there just to keep that dry. And then we put a separate manifold in out here for the garage and just three circuits, half inch tubing. You see, we worked around the floor drains. Uh, the black dashes that you see here, these are control joints. These are locations of saw cuts in the slab. And we sleeve the joints so uh, if there's any, any slight movement in the slab at that point, we're not putting direct stress on the tubing. And let's see, I think we talked about most of this. Uh, our basement circuits, even at design load, the average water temperature is 98 degrees. Uh, again, we've got two inches of foam insulation all the way around our concrete walls here. And then there's a two by four wall that has a three and a half inch mineral wool bat in. And the, the actual structural wall is an eight inch reinforced poured concrete wall. So a pretty straightforward layout here for the uh, tubing. Uh, you can see all our circuits are identified with a length. So we know when we draw this, we use the CAD system to measure the length. We know that we're, uh, we're establishing reasonable lengths for our tubing circuits. And we also know how much tubing to order. So here's some photos of that tubing going down. Uh, my good friend Harvey Euchre, a longtime hydronics contractor, I, I call him a hydronics artisan, he does beautiful work. Uh, one of the things he likes to do, he'll take the tubing plan and he'll go in there with a few cans of colored spray paint. And you can see here, he's kind of laid out where the tubing's going to go. And of course, he's doing that before the tubing goes down. Uh, so, you know, if it take an hour or two to take a tubing plan and some spray paint, you don't have to spray paint the entire circuit. You can see, for example, here, he's just spray painted where the return bends are gonna be. This really helps when it's time to pull the tubing off the coil and fasten it down and save, save a lot of time in the field by doing a tubing plan and doing a, a layout. Uh, we set up the manifold station here, just a couple pieces of rebar down through the foam and a piece of plywood as a, as a board to hold that manifold. Um, this is the tubing out in the breezeway. You can see our six inch on center spacing here. We have to widen out our tubing bends a little bit so we don't kink any tubing at that point. And actually all that tubing goes back through a two inch PVC sleeve that actually goes back through the poured concrete wall and brings our tubing into the basement where we can uh, extend it over to the mechanical room. Uh, this is the morning of the pour right here concrete crew setting up, uh, they actually took a piece, I think that's a 12 inch um, piece of PVC pipe and they use that as their chute extender. And they were able to back right up close to the wall with the truck and uh, run all that right down through the chute. So the entire basement has two inches of foam insulation under the slab. 
The only exception, it's a little hard to see it, but the only exception is where there's some bearing footings here. We have a center bearing wall, so there's actually no foam right here, and the, the concrete slab would be thickened at that area, and there's another area over here. Um, you can see there's two inches of foam here along the entire wall as well. And the basement portion of the system is simple. It's a three-way motorized mixing valve that operates based on outdoor reset control. It's a small ECM circulator that's running at a constant speed. We aren't modulating our flow rate into the basement. Uh, at, this, at least at this point, there's no need to do that. And then a manifold with the five circuits on it with its own thermostat. And uh, this piping leads back. And again, you'll see how that ties into the overall system. Here's our outdoor reset curve. So at um, minus 10, actually, I'm showing about 90 degree water on this uh, graph right here. Uh, this is just a combination of a lot of insulation. And most of our tube spacing in that basement is 12 inches on center. Right out near the exposed wall, you can see over here, we're at six inches on center in roughly about three feet, just to get a little higher output where uh, where our losses are higher. And if you look close, you can see we do have two inches of foam all along that perimeter wall. We actually tapered the upper side of that foam at a 45 degree angle. And that's so when the concrete is poured, it'll actually come right up to, or come very close to the six inch wide wall at that point. So by the time you put the two by six wall, the drywall and the base molding on, uh, there's not gonna be any foam showing. So these are small details. You can actually see them right here too. Some tapered foam on that side, a little bit over on that side and uh, pretty straightforward. Now let's move up a floor. This is the main living level of the house uh, over here on the left. This is the, the great room, the kitchen, the dining area and the living room. Uh, again, the living room, you, you don't see any floor heating there because that's where the big area rug is gonna be. So here's a couple of 48 inch wide, 24 inch tall panel radiators. Uh, the kitchen area where we had just an engineered hardwood floor, that is uh, eight inch on center tube spacing. And that uses aluminum plates over the tubing. These are five inch wide, 24 inch long aluminum plates. And uh, these center lines that you see here, these thin black lines, these are the center lines of the floor joists. So when I made this drawing to show the tubing layout, we always like to locate our framing because obviously we've got to put our tubing and our plates in between that framing. And we worked it out so we had eight inches on center coordinated with 24 inch on center framing. There's a couple circuits here. They come back to the mechanical room and actually they eventually tie to a manifold that doesn't show up but the manifolds over in this area right here. Uh, the other two floor circuits, there's the master bathroom. So this was kind of, I'll be honest with you, this is kind of a tedious layout right here because these are very short runs just because of the geometry of the room. But they they did go in, we did put the aluminum plates on and uh, eight inches on center. Uh, we have another run that goes over here. This is the uh, second bathroom on the main level that ceramic tile flooring. Uh, one thing I didn't point out, if I go back to the kitchen, we did not install any plates under the kitchen island. And the idea there is, well, we, you know, we've got cabinetry, an island above the floor. Uh, they don't plan to store food there, but who knows, over time, somebody might eventually store some food there. And we don't wanna heat up any cabinets that might have food stored in. It's, it's just gonna cause you know, premature spoilage of the food. So instead of trying to route all the tubing around it, we simply didn't put any plates on. So there might be a trickle of heat there, but it's, it's really uh, without the plates on it uh, and the tubing not stapled up tight to the floor, it's, it's really gonna be minimal transfer. And I'll wrap this up. The, the other panel radiators that you see are in the three bedrooms. Uh, here's a uh, 36 inch by 24 high panel rad, uh, 48 inch by 24 panel rad here. And then the master bedroom's a little bit larger. There's a couple windows there. Uh, that has a 63 inch long panel rad. Now these radiators might look a little large for these rooms, 
But remember, we're, we aimed at design load on, on a very low water temperature, so we have good compatibility with the heat pump. And uh, right now, as I say, we're running at design load, we're running about 110 degree water. And these three pan radiators all have thermostatic valves. And to coordinate the uh, thermostatic valve approach, we also set up valves for the floor heating in the two uh, bathrooms to use uh, these thermostatic radiator valves. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, remember, thermostatic radiator valves, many of you are used to seeing them on panel radiators, built right into the panel radiator. But you can also get these valves that have a capillary tube that leads off between the actual knob where you adjust the room temperature and where the valve is located. And that's what we used in the two bathrooms here. So we actually have five areas of heating that are being controlled by non-electric thermostatic valves. And then the one thermostat on this level does control these two radiators and these two floor heating circuits. John, while you're going through this, we actually do have a question. Uh, okay. This is a general question on the master bedroom and the fact the radiator panel is uh, where it's located. Uh, yep. Yep. The um, question is not, not, on, not on the exterior wall. He's noting you have it on the interior wall. I'm looking for you to comment on that. Yep. Interesting. Good question and good observation. Uh, this was done because, honestly, the bed and the, and the two nightstands that went in there were huge. <laughs> and we were not able to put that panel. I would have preferred the panel over here, but because of the furniture layout, there's just no way to do that. And with these R values in the wall, quite honestly, uh, I don't perceive any comfort difference. So uh, you can put a panel radiator on an interior wall. Normally we like exterior walls with possible, but again, we, we uh, looked at this, we actually put scale, representations of the bed and the two nightstands and found there's just no good way to make that fit in that room with that radiator up in this area here. So. Now, John, there was another question that came in that's a good one, and which is uh, how well the transfer plates work. If you look at independent studies that are out there, Virginia Tech University in particular did a study looking at regular staple up, pegging it around 10 to 12 BTUs per square foot, at 110 mean water, uh, mm -hmm. putting transfer plates on that makes a significant increase. You can get easily, you know, 17 BTUs per square foot at the same temperature. What yeah, are your we, thoughts on not not using plates? Uh, I don't like not using plates. We call it plateless staple up. Um, this, I call this, it the constipated heating system. Well, thermally <laughs> constipated heating is another way to look at it. Uh, honestly, folks, you will not find this in any part of the world other than North America. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that should tell you something. Uh, the transfer plates, we years ago, we set up um, some modeling where we used something called finite element analysis to study uh, plate, plated systems versus unplated systems where everything's identical except on the two systems we're comparing, one system has the plates, the other system doesn't. We got a three to one output ratio. We got three times the heat output with the plates compared to the plateless system. So I, I, again, I'll, I'll stress, to get the best performance out of these heat pumps, we want the lowest possible water temperatures. And the way that you get to low water temperatures is designing efficient heat emitters. So putting those plates on in a system like this is, is a critical detail. Eight inches on center, uh, the plates are on there, and also we used a six inch fiberglass bats. And uh, one of the other questions that, that I get, and this kind of goes back several years in the radiant industry, should you push the insulation right up against the bottom of the plates or leave an air gap? And uh, actually there was, Ashray did a study on this through uh, Kansas State University several years ago, and they actually found better performance when the insulation was pushed up against the bottom of the aluminum plates. So just push the insulation up there. We use craft face bats and we used a little tab on the craft facing just to staple the bat, hold it in place there. 